welcome to ArchCloud Labs Posh C2 tutorial series. Posh C2 is an open source C2 framework with cross-platform support for Windows, Linux, and OS X. Posh C2 is maintained by Netitude, a cybersecurity consulting company. In this video series, we will focus on leveraging Posh C2 in a Linux environment. Additionally, we'll cover initial interaction, shell management, cooperating with other red teamers, and how to customize Posh C2's post-exploitation payloads. Let's get started. The Posh C2 README on GitHub contains verbose documentation on how to get started with the Posh C2 framework. Additionally, it has a link to a Rebidox page, which I encourage all users to read. Scrolling down further, we can see a nice little bash one-liner that will start to install the Posh C2 framework. Go ahead and copy this and run it as sudo to begin the installation process. Now that Posh C2 has been successfully installed on our attacker machine, we can configure how we want our payloads and implants to call back to us. However, before we do that, let's take a look at the infrastructure that we have set up for this tutorial series. Here we see our two local VMs, the Akali Attacker Machine and the Ubuntu Target. Additionally, we have our DigitalOcean C2 box hanging out in the upper right hand corner. Now, we're going to use our Kali Attacker Machine with some default credentials, that's going to be the scenario here, to go ahead and drop the initial payload on the Ubuntu Target. After that, there will be no direct interaction between the Akali Attacker Machine and the Ubuntu Target again. From that point on, the Ubuntu machine is going to call out to our C2 box, which has a reverse SSH tunnel connecting it back to the Kali Attacker machine. Now, Posh C2 uh, states that it's a proxy-aware framework, and it has a lot of documentation on how to set up you know, domain fronting or Apache rewrite rules. Uh, definitely check that out. For this scenario, we're just doing something a little bit simpler, and we're just using a reverse SSH tunnel that'll bring us back into our VM. We can make modifications to our Posh C2 configuration by running posh-config. This will bring you to our configuration menu where we can specify the IP to listen on, the port to bind to, what our install directory is, and what our project directory is, along with the database type we're using. Right now it would be SQLite by default, but Postgres bindings exist as well. The payload communication host along with the port that we're going to have our implant call out to. A few other options depending on the type of environment you're setting up, so if you want to do domain fronting, options exist for that. Along with user agent customization, default sleep and jitter time. One interesting thing here I want to spend some time on is our URL config, and this actually gets loaded from a file on disk, so you can actually modify this to make it a little bit more realistic to what your implant would call out to, depending on your environment. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this in a new tab. Oh, misspelled there. You're going to want to go to posh 2 resources, and then URLs. So this allows you to specify what your agent will call out to when it's making these HTTP requests. So you can specify, hey, is it just going to be like index.php or do you want to add a little bit more believability here with some custom URIs. After you feel comfortable with what you have, go ahead and right quit out of this and we'll save our config and we'll start the Posh C2 server and go ahead and deliver our first implant. Before starting the Posh C2 server, we're going to go ahead and set up our reverse tunnel. And I already have a nice little cheat sheet here, so I'm just going to copy and paste this. As an additional step, I'm just going to run ps-ef real quick and double check that this process is indeed running in the background, making sure that my tunnel's up. Now we're going to go ahead and start the Posh server in the top of this Tmux pane. If you're not familiar with Tmux, I would definitely recommend uh, taking a look at a tutorial somewhere. It makes life a lot easier when you're navigating a bunch of different SSH shells, and it also works very well with a Posh C2 workflow. In the bottom pane here, we're going to connect uh, to the server with our username of DLLCoolJ, and you can specify that with a dash U when you run Posh. Now that we're logged in, we see that we have no implants of this current time. Now if we scroll up in the Posh C2 server pane, we can actually see a bunch of nice little one-liners that will interact with our URL of dllcoolj.xyz to download and execute payloads largely only on Windows hosts. All of this data does also exist on disk, and I'm going to pop open a new pane really quick and show you where that resides. You're going to navigate to your Posh C2 project directory and you should see a quick start dot text and this is where you can have a nice little reference material for all your one-liners. We can also check out the payloads directory so this is where all of the dynamically generated payloads are going to reside. 
We also have our rewrite rules if you went ahead and set up a uh, proxy with Apache according to Pashti2's documentation. Heading back on over to our cheat sheet, we're going to go ahead and get ready to deliver our payload to our Ubuntu target. First, we're actually going to set up a Python 3 simple HTTP server in our project directory, so that way we can just do a nice little curl one-liner, and then this will be the last time the Ubuntu target interacts directly with the Kali machine. Note, when you do set up this HTTP server, you are exposing all of the payloads, so consider that uh, not something you should do in practice. At this point, we can log in with SSH with our default credentials, and run our curl command. Now we have a shell that can interact with the Ubuntu target. The number 5 to the left indicates that this is the fifth callback that this Posh C2 server has received. So let's go ahead and interact with it by selecting the implant ID of 5. And now we get prompted with this nice little shell. Note, anything you execute here, you're going to execute on the remote host. So be careful of mistypes. Let's begin with a little bit of process triage with ps-aux. We'll see the output of that command is displayed on the posh server up top. Now we're going to go ahead and change the beacon just for this implant by typing beacon space 3s for 3 seconds. Now we'll go back to the main menu by typing back. So that's great and all. We have confirmed interaction with our target. Fantastic. But let's go ahead and actually dive into what this uh, one-liner actually does. So we're going to CD on over to the payloads directory within our posh 2 project directory and uh, take a look at this base64 encoded blob. Right off the bat, we have a couple Python import statements followed by uh, base64 decode, and then that big old blob just gets thrown into exec and piped to Python 2 and then sent to the background. So we're going to take this big old Python uh, base64 blob here and throw it into a separate file. Whoop. We're going to put this into slash temp and let's take a look at what's happening underneath the hood. So we can see there's a handful of import statements at the top, no surprise there, followed by a couple unique things to our particular implant. We have our kill date, which was set in our configuration file when we started the posh t2 server, uh, the hash, the pi key, an encryption key, uh, the callout to our domain with server clean, and then we have a couple URLs specified within that URL text we were looking at when we were configuring our server. Some host headers, which are blank, we weren't doing anything with that, uh, the user agent, etc, etc. So if we go ahead and look at the bottom line here, after the request is made and we decrypt the contents of the response, we're going to go ahead and base64 decode that and then just run exec on whatever that uh, payload is that we've passed through. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and reference some Python documentation on what exactly exec will do for us. So looking at the documentation, this function supports the dynamic execution of Python code. So effectively, it has support for us to pass in a big old string that's actually Python code and have that get executed. So with that in mind, uh, in a later video, we're actually going to look at creating a post module that will go ahead and drop some SSH keys for persistence. Uh, basically, this just allows for a lot of uh, easy flexibility within Posh 2 framework to add in new modules because effectively it's just going to be running Python code underneath the hood. Now that we have a good foundation of uh, how to set up and start using Posh 2 let's go ahead and go back on over to our console and look at a couple of the options that we may find useful along the way. So note that we're not interacting with any specific session right now and what we're going to do is change the default timeout for all new sessions that get spawned. So the way that we can do this is by go ahead and executing the set hyphen default beacon space and then specify whatever time you want. Here we're just going to do 20 seconds. This is not going to affect any pre-existing beacon time. Only new callbacks are going to be affected by this setting. Speaking of callbacks, let's go ahead and spawn another one. With this, we're going to go ahead and interact with our pre-existing session. So go ahead and hit 5 or whatever the implant ID is for you. And then we're going to execute the built-in command to posh 2 of start another implant. This will go ahead and spawn another implant for us, and we're going to hit back and wait for this implant to call back. Now we have two shells on our target machine. Notice that the second shell, the ID6, has a 20 second beacon time. This goes back to the global setting that we applied moments ago. 
Now let's go ahead and apply a label to our second callback. This is just metadata added to the server side, so that way we can quickly identify hosts based on uh, whatever characteristics we want to apply here. Perhaps a don't use unless it's an emergency, or started on day two, etc., etc. Now the final thing we're going to talk about is a little bit of a shell management, which is going to be uh, hiding implants. Now that doesn't mean hiding them on the machine, it means hiding them from end user view on the server side. So if you go ahead and interact with an agent, so I'm going to go ahead and interact with agent 5, and I'm going to say hide hyphen implant. What this ends up doing is actually just removing it from the list of what end users will see once they connect to your Posh C2 server. It does not remove them uh, from play, so to speak. So anything that ends up getting called back, uh, if it dies, etc., anything that would cause a server status message will be displayed in the Posh server logs, so our top pane here. Uh, but it is kind of a way just to make sure, like, hey, maybe this one we're not going to have uh, uh, everyone exposed to because only you want to interact with it, or there's another reason why you just don't want it to be shown to others that are going to be connecting to your Posh T2 server. Now, that doesn't stop anyone from just going through the gamut and typing in a bunch of implant IDs and then eventually stumbling upon this, the implant that you hid. But uh, just be aware that this is a feature, but it does not by any means provide like access control. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to our Posh T2 server as another user, just to show you what this looks like. So we see here, I only see implant 6, which I have access to. I don't know about implant 5, but if I go ahead and interact with implant 5, and I run the id command, we will go ahead and get that output to the server logs shown above, and everyone's going to be able to see this. So just be aware, that's what that looks like. And that wraps it up for our first video tutorial series of how to get started with Posh C2 on Linux. Absolutely destroy that like button, ring that bell if you found this of any value. I uh, really appreciate you watching, and uh, follow me on Twitter for more. Thank you.